Good afternoon, Broad River! What a day we had yesterday, our Amplify and Ignite 2018 Leadership Summit. And I guess you could call this the uh, encore main event. Uh, we've got a featured speaker that I'm so happy uh, to, to, that this person will be here to share his story um, with all of us here today. And I guess the cat is officially out of the bag. Uh, um, uh, we have got uh, Mr. Inky Johnson to come share his story with us. Give him a, uh, another warm round of applause. Man, Charlie, you got to take me to the decompress room, man. <laughs> My energy rose up, man. But um, first and foremost, I want to let you all know it's an honor and a privilege to be here before you all. You know, every opportunity I get to speak, I was just having lunch with some of the guys upstairs, and I was just telling them that, you know, speaking is not something that I plan to do. And so for me, every opportunity I get, it's an extreme level of gratitude that comes with it. You know, because I'm cognizant that people don't have to listen to you. You know, people don't have to stop and say, hey, man, thank you for what you do. And so me, I, I live my life with a high level of gratitude every single day with the people I meet and the places that I go into. And so I was, up, I was upstairs and it was, it was phenomenal for me, you know, because they were talking about and recapping yesterday and some of the moments that happened. And a word that I kept hearing come up was purpose. Right. About life, about situations, about family, about how they got into this business. And I think it's phenomenal. And I'm a psychology guy. Right. I'm a mindset guy. And so I played sports my whole life prior to my injury. I was a four sport athlete. And so I never really rested. I went from football to basketball to baseball to track and field from the time I was seven years old until I went to college. Then I was just straight football. But I was always intrigued by how when a person said something, whether they wanted something, whether there was something they wanted to accomplish, whether it was a goal, dream, aspirations, whatever the case may have been, when they said it, if situations, circumstances changed, the words that they once spoke didn't mean anything to them. Like the level of commitment would diminish, right? And not the counterfeit commitment that says, yes, I'll show up, yes, I'll do it, yes, I'll be on time. I'm talking about the commitment that says, I am going to stay true to what I said I would do long after the mood that I've set it in has left. Meaning on the days when I don't feel like doing what I once said I was going to do, I'm going to still show up and give you everything I got because character is not something we inherit. Character is something we got to wake up every single day. We got to fight and we got to build it in the midst of opposition, adversity and challenges. And if we only work when we felt like it, none of us would get much accomplished. All right. And so every Sunday I ask myself a question, a couple of questions, actually. And the questions that I pose to myself is, if this was the last week of your life, how would you live it? If this was the last week I had with my wife and my two children, how would I treat them? If this was the last week I had to do the work that I've been blessed to be able to do, how would I go about it? And the reason that I live my life that way is because September 9, 2006, I had been working for something from 7 to 20 years old, and I became extremely close to it. This dream to go to the NFL institution, National Football League, which I would soon find out it didn't stand for just National Football League. It also stood for not for long. Right. <laughs> and so I got to a point where I was 10 games away from making it happen. This NFL dream, becoming a multimillionaire, helping my family, grew up in the city, of Atlanta, two bedroom home, 14 people. Mother had me at 16 years old, worked a double shift at Wendy's from the time I was a kid until I was a freshman in college. And so it meant everything to me. And in one moment, in one play, doing something that I did every single day, and it was never work to me. Like football was recreation every day of my life. Like I never experienced a hard day of football in my life. It was football to me, right? I started playing football in the street, right? Bloody, pure passion, not too much wisdom, <laughs> right? And so when I got on grass, I'm like, man, I'm on grass. <laughs> I was like, y'all don't stand a chance. I grew up playing in the street. <laughs> and so when this moment happened, it was almost surreal. Like, I, I never thought about you could work and give everything you got to something 
And you can hit one moment of opposition, adversity and a challenge and everything that you once worked for could disappear overnight and not only disappear, but you can wake up the next day and your life will change. So people were coming into my room saying, Inky, your football career has ended. Nobody came and said, Inky, your life has changed. Like I woke up and my arm was paralyzed. I woke up, got scars all over my body, incisions from surgery. I'm talking about the game I got injured. I came out at the same exact time. Every home game, my ritual was the exact same way. I listened to the same exact pregame music. Phil Collins, I can feel it coming. <laughs> that was my joint. All right? Listen to it the same time. Set my prayer at the same time. And I go out and do something I had done over a thousand times. And the results were different. And so I firmly believe a person's life and the manifestation thereof is a result of how they handle the transactions of life. And when I say the transactions of life, I'm not speaking about a business deal. I'm not speaking about putting together a situation or having a certain product. When I say the transactions of life, I'm speaking about when you give something a certain amount of energy, passion, time, dedication, and commitment, you expect it to yield a certain result. And when it don't yield the result that you expect it, the transaction becomes the problem. It's almost like if you're going the extra mile for your wife and you're expecting a certain level of confirmation and validation, and after a while when you don't get it, at a certain point you're going to be like, man, I've been washing the dishes, taking out the trash, cleaning the car. Like, you, you ain't going to tell me thank you? <laughs> Like the transaction going to become the problem, right? It's like when a person comes to work or in their careers and they're trying to like get in with somebody and so they're doing all the right things, saying all the right things and they're seeking a certain level of validation and when they don't get it, it starts to alter their performance. It's like an athlete, he gets on a team and he's third string and he wants to become a starter and he may even have the talent to become a starter and so he starts trying to go the extra mile, do certain things, stop by the coach's office, but the intentions aren't right. He's doing it because he wants to become a starter, but he's not putting himself in a position to where he's becoming undeniable, to where he has to get played. Because of his effort, his dedication, his commitment, and the way he applies himself to the game, and so he has to get played. But he's taking the route of, I'm going to just put myself in a position so I can get a certain level of validation, and hopefully he sees it. But if he doesn't seize it and acknowledge it, I'm not going to give him everything I got because he didn't give me the validation that I expected. And so now the question became, could I be committed to the process of what I was doing without being emotionally attached to the results of what I was doing? In other words, if I didn't get what I was expecting to get, can I still show up and act as if it's day one and give you everything I got? If the situation didn't turn out the way that I thought it would turn out, can I still take the situation, embrace it, and figure out a way to add value to every person's life that I come in contact with in every environment that I go into, the transaction, right? When I don't get what I'm supposed to get, when I start questioning my purpose and if this is what I'm really supposed to do, and your wife says to you, you sure? You know, when your wife say you sure, you're like, oh, man, I got to <laughs> I got to think about this. Like, I still remember my first trip to speak. I drove a total round trip of 15 hours to some town in Mississippi. I got there. I spoke. I loved it. He was like, all right, Inc., thanks, man. Really appreciate it. Gave me a coffee mug. I'm like, oh, okay, appreciate it. <laughs> I got back to Atlanta, 2.30 in the morning. As soon as I opened the door, my wife's sitting there like, yep. I'm like, hey, babe, how you doing? How was your trip? Oh, it was great. Okay, what you get? I'm like, they gave me this cool coffee mug. <laughs> he said, you sure? You feel you've been called to do this? I said, yes, ma'am. I think this is what I'm supposed to do. She said, you sure? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, go for it. And so I'm the type of person, and I'm sure a lot of you guys are this way, if I make a sacrifice, it has to count. If somebody on my team makes a sacrifice, oh, it's going to count. Right? And so my whole life, I had people that made sacrifices for me at certain phases of my life, and my effort was predicated upon me honoring their, their sacrifice. 
And so my mother working at Wendy's was such a blessing for me because most nights when I played rec league football, I would be in the park till about 9, 30, 10 at night. Everybody would leave. Everybody would go home. I would be sitting there wait, waiting on my mother. She worked two blocks away from the park. And she would pull up and she drove the old beat up Buick Regal with t T-top. <laughs> Loved it. Hubcaps off the car, seats torn up, car beat up. My mother would pull up in that park and I would be sitting there on the bleachers. And I would get up, she would open her door, I would run over, I would hug her, I would kiss her. And I would say, Mom, if you don't mind, can you please sit back in your car and turn on your car lights? I got to do some extra drills. I got to go to the NFL so you'll never have to work another day in your life. We were in that two-bedroom home with 14 people, sleeping on the floor. And I knew she was tired. And every night, my mother would go, and she would sit in that old beat-up Big Regal. Car lights would hit that field. And you had this kid out there doing the W drill, running laps. Get in the car, thank you, Mom. So when the game came, I never saw my opponent. I saw my mother in the park in a Buick Regal after she had got done working a double shift. When I had to run laps, I never saw the laps. I saw my mother, the sacrifices she made. When I had to go the extra mile, I never saw the situation, the circumstance, and what came with it. Because I'm a firm believer, when a person say they want something, right? Like I always ask people, like, what are you working for? What do you want from it? Right. And when a person say they want something like you got to be willing to accept whatever come with it. You can't say I told a little kid two weeks ago, I said, you can't be a gangster until you meet a gangster. <laughs> I say, you want to be tough with everybody until you meet the tough guy. I was just with a team two weeks ago. I'm sitting there and they just own this whole little deal to where they like, oh, man, we're great. We're excellent. They did their thing last year. They won their conference championship. They crushed it. Right. They did it. They did it up well. And so they're riding on a high right now. Everybody is great. Everybody is excellent. Everybody is a beast. That's what everybody is talking about. And so I'm getting ready to speak to them. And I'm sitting in the hallway and somebody threw a Gatorade bottle on the floor. I don't even know who it was. I'm just standing on the wall. I'm shaking their hands as they're walking by. I can see the Gatorade bottle clear as day. They're just walking by. Yeah, man. Yep. What's up? Yep. They walk in the room, I go, I pick the Gatorade bottle up, I walk in the room behind them. And everybody that came by me, they was like, hey, Ink, you want me to throw that Gatorade bottle away? I'm like, no, I'm good, I'm about to use this. <laughs> <laughs> and so everybody is looking at me as I'm standing up, they're like, why he got a Gatorade bottle in his hand? And I just posed a question to them. Y'all said y'all were great, right? Yeah, we, y'all said y'all were beasts, right? Yep. Y'all won a conference championship. Y'all, y'all Tarzan, right? <laughs> yeah. I said, how are you going to be great? How are you going to be excellent? You can't even pick up a Gatorade bottle. I said, it's not who you are. Like, you can talk about it, but it's not your essence. It's not your core. Because when something is a person's core, they, they approach every facet and every phase of it like, this is me. This is a representation of who I am and my lineage. Like everything I touch, I just firmly believe it's supposed to be made better as a result of my presence. Like everything that I do, everything I'm blessed to be inserted into, I believe when I get done with it, like the level of it is supposed to be raised because of my presence and I was blessed to be a part of it. Like I'm not one of these people that could do something and just do it and count the hours and not make the hours count. I'm not one of those people. Like sometimes my wife comes in and she gets on me because I'm going at it with my seven-year-old son about something. And she's like, let him win. He's seven. I'm like, I forgot. <laughs> I said, I forgot. All I was thinking about was going hard. I'm trying to teach him life. It wasn't a light switch mentality attached to it. And so something happened at a very young age in my life, and it shifted the trajectory of my life. And so I love people. Right. I love people. and There's nothing that people could do about it to, to, you know, you could if you do something to my wife and kids, we might got a problem. Right. <laughs> but with me. Right. I'm on a level to where I love people. Right. And a guy said to me, I was doing an interview on his podcast and he said to me, he said, Inky, we live life on two different sides of the spectrum. I said, how so, sir? 
He said, I believe when a person gets an opportunity to hurt you, they're going to hurt you and take advantage of you. He said, now somehow you believe when you look at people, you just see the good in people, man. Like you always just looking at a person, giving person benefit of the doubt. I said, well, I just believe there's some good in the worst of us and there's some bad in the best of us. I said, but I haven't seen yet how looking at a person and trying to find a negative can help me become the leader, the man, the father, and the servant that I strive to become. I haven't seen yet how complaining about somebody can help me become the leader that I'm trying to become. You ever saw somebody, they just keep beating a dead horse, right? You're like, man, you still on that? You still talking about that? Are you still talking about what happened two weeks ago? Like you haven't let it ride yet? Like I can't give that much energy to something. But what happened was when I was coming up on the east side of Atlanta and I was playing football in the street, people don't know the way that I got involved in football. And so me and my cousins created a routine, me and my three younger cousins. And so we're being, we're being like born into a family to where my grandmother and grandfather, my grandmother dropped out in the third grade, my grandfather dropped out in the fifth grade. They had 16 kids. Out of the 16, three went to cop. Um, three graduated high school. None went to college. Out of 16, three went, graduated high school. And so the expectation, extremely low. They didn't care if you went to college. They didn't care if you graduated high school. Like, they heard your little dreams, and it was all good. But it was like, yeah, man, we got a track record of dropouts. We got a track record of pipe dreams, right? And so when I said NFL, everybody's like, Okay, little Ink, I hear you. Yeah, but we'll see. He'll probably fizzle out when he gets to high school. And so I told my cousins, I said, okay, since we can't get signed up, we'll just come home every day. We'll play tackle football in the street. Street lights pop on. Ten minutes before we got to go in the house, we'll get it in. And so we start doing it, routine. And one night we're in the street, we're getting after it, playing ball. Street lights pop on. And it's a blue pickup truck at the corner. Never forget it. And I had the ball in my hand, and so I stand on the sidewalk. And my three younger cousins stand on the opposite sidewalk. And so I'm looking at this truck, and I'm waving it by, because I'm like, man, I got a couple moves I want to put on these jokers before I got to go in the house. <laughs> like, come on, man. And the guy starts driving really slow. And when he passes us, it's the first white guy we had ever saw in our neighborhood. And so when he opens his door to get out of his truck, every drug dealer take off running, gang members take <laughs> off running. They think he's the cops, right? <laughs> Nicest guy in the world. Walks over between our games, like, hey, man, would y'all like to play football on grass? And I'm like, brother, I would love that. Where you been, man? <laughs> like, this street getting rough. <laughs> he said, go get your parents. Get your guardian. I run in the house. I get my Uncle JJ. I said, Uncle, will you please come and speak to this gentleman? Uncle said, sure. Uncle walked outside. Guy extended his hand. I said, hey, man, my name is Trey Hurst. He said, I don't even supposed to be over here. I brought a kid home, dropped him off after practice just checking out the neighborhood, and I see these little knuckleheads playing tackle football in the street. He said, I run a program across town. I think if you brought the boys out, sign them up, great opportunity, it could really help them. My uncle's response was, sir, we greatly appreciate it. He said, I hate to inform you, but we don't have the money for anything like that at this moment. He pointed at me, he said, Ink's mother, she's working a double shift at Wendy's, single mom, she don't have it. He said, the other three, their fathers are in and out of the system. They don't have it. The coach, without any hesitation, says, I tell you what, you bring him to the park tomorrow, I'll sign him up, I'll pay for it with my own money. I'm like, man, he ain't even see my spin move yet, man. <laughs> like, he ain't see my moves yet, man. I'm like, what type of guy is this, right? Next day, my uncle brought us to the park. I stood in line beside him because I was intrigued by it. And I'm sitting there and I'm watching him take cash out of his own pocket. He's paying for me and my three younger cousins to play ball. And I wanted to understand not so much of the action, I wanted to understand why did he do it. And so one night when he had to take me home after practice, my mother couldn't get off for a shift. We ride up to my house and it's 125 Warren Street. And I get out of the truck and I'm standing on the sidewalk and he said, all right, Inc., I'll catch you tomorrow at practice. I said, all right, coach. I said, can I ask you something? He said, sure, what you got, Inc.? I said, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but I really want to know. He said, man, I love you. Opened his door, got out of his truck, Stood right in front of me, said, what you got? Shoot away. I said, why do you do what you do? And why do you live life the way that you live it? I said, because I want to know. He said, son, I'm going to share something with you, and I don't want you to ever forget it. And in the simplicity, it was yet profound. And all he said to me was, Inc., as long as you can live your life and make sure that somebody else's life is okay, 
He said, son, your life will always be okay. And he got in his truck and he left. And the way I processed it was, man, if I can annihilate, like, my ego. Like, I had a teacher. He was always on this submission of ego. Every single day walking in his class, submission of ego. Ink, kill off your ego. Right? Because I grew up in this, in this environment to where I had to have an edge. I was never the biggest, never the fastest, never the strongest, never the most talented. But my advantage was I wasn't afraid of work. Right. Because I always felt as if you got to take my life before you take my drive. And if it's predicated upon hard work, well, that's something that we both can control. And I've, I've been on this quote that says through the eyes of a person, you can see their soul. And so if I'm working and you get to a point to where I know you've never been there before, I'm going to just annihilate you. And so if I could work for something, I firmly believe the harder a person works, the harder it is for them to surrender. And when a person doesn't have anything invested in what they do, it's easy for them to walk away from it or don't value it because they didn't sacrifice anything for it and it didn't cost them anything. I'm reminded of a story, right, about a, a father and a son. And it's amazing because at the foundation of what this story was, this father was trying to find a babysitter, right, for his son. And so he couldn't and he had to take his son to a conference with him. And so he told his son, I'm going to just sit you in the back of the room. I'm going to go to this conference and I know you probably want to enjoy it. And the son's sitting there and a the lady gets up to speak and she's talking about impact. She's talking about service, talking about purpose. And the son loves it. After the conference, they get home that night. Son goes into the father's room and said, Dad, man, I really enjoyed that. Dad said, that's cool. He said, I want to do something to make a difference. Dad said, what do you got in mind? He said, can you get me a job at the local grocery store? Dad said, sure, that should be easy. What do you want to do? So I just want to bag groceries. I said, sure, no problem. Dad goes up, tell the people about it. They say, sure, no problem, bring him down. Son starts bagging groceries. Two weeks in, he comes home to his father. He said, Dad, I'm really enjoying what I'm doing. He said, but I, I want to do something to make a deeper impact. Dad said, man, yeah, I got it. Just when you bag their groceries, wave at them, tell them have a good day. That's your work. The son said, no, I want to do something to make a deeper impact. Dad said, what do you have in mind? He said, I want to make note cards, and I want to put them in the bags. Can you help me make copies? Dad said, sure, man, I got your back. Son starts doing it. One day the manager comes into the store. He goes upstairs to the team members. He said, um, why is everybody in line eight in this little kid's line? <laughs> <laughs> he said, somebody get on the intercom, tell them we got seven, we got six, and we got five open. They got on the intercom and said, guys, we know everybody's in line eight, little Johnny's line. I want y'all to know we got seven, we got six, and we got five open. Nobody moved. He said, go down to the floor and tell them. They ran down to the floor. Hey, guys, we see everybody's in little Johnny the baggage line. We got seven, we got six, and we got five open. People said, we know. <laughs> they said, we want to get his word of the day. They said it got so crazy, people started getting a stoplight away from the store, didn't need groceries. They would go and get a loaf of bread and be in line calling their friends like, man, you got to come here. You got to get this little kid's note card, right? And the thing that blew my mind was here you had this kid that drove business to an institution and it wasn't based upon a business strategy. It was based upon a heart and an intent that was geared in the right place and it yielded a certain result. At the foundation of it was what? People. At the foundation of it, the X factor was how I treat people, how I value people. The product could take care of itself. At the foundation of it, it's this thing they say in football. It's not so much about the X's and the O's as it is about the Jimmy's and the Joe's. Meaning you can have whatever strategy you got. You could be the best coach in the world. You could be Nick Saban. But if you don't have a connection with the players and the people, the strategy that you, ha the strategy that you have, it will never work. You can have all type of shoes. You can have the best people in the world. If you don't have a connection, it will never work. And so now when I see people, like I don't see them as just a James, a Allison, a Robert. When I see people and I connect with them, I'm like, that's not by coincidence. When I get offered the opportunity to do something, I'm like, man, I get an opportunity to do this. This is incredible. Like approaching it with the perspective of I don't have to, I get to. And I'm a firm believer that perspective drives performance every day of the week. How a person view what they do will always affect how they do what they do. And so if I meet somebody and they say, oh, man, I want to be rich, I'm like, cool, nothing wrong with that. But the true measure of your wealth is if you got it, then you lost it, then how much would you be worth? How much is your character worth? How much is your integrity worth? Like me and my wife got three homeless shelters in Atlanta. 
right? And we do work with inner city youth. And I was with a kid, a 15 year old, his mother called me and she's like, Inky, can you come and get him? I'm like, come and get who? <laughs> My 15 year old. He's disrespecting authority, disrespecting teachers, disrespecting me. He won't listen to anybody. I don't want him to go to jail. I said, can I smack him when I get to him? <laughs> I said, can I, I'll meet you, I'll get him. I meet her with the guy, we get out, we ride downtown Atlanta under a bridge, and it's this gentleman, sleeps on the I-20 East, cardboard box, doesn't want any help, sits there, great person. And we ride up, got some food, engaging in dialogue. I tap the kid, he's a jelly bean. Hard on the outside, soft on the inside, just a jelly bean. I said, hey champ, I said, you're brilliant, you're smart, right? You're, you're the man. I said, you think that was strategic? I said, you think he planned that? I said, you think when he was, he was your age, he said, man, I'm going to be up on the I-20 East, downtown Atlanta. Kid said, no. I said, take a shot. What you think happened? He said, I don't know. Ink. I said, no, you tough guy. You bad. You Michael Jackson bad. <laughs> Take a shot. What you think happened? He said, I don't know. Ink, what you think happened? I said, I think life happened. He said, life? I said, I guarantee you he had something he wanted. I guarantee you somebody told him how great he was. I guarantee you he had a certain skill set. I guarantee you at a certain point he was a part of something and he was killing it. I said, but what he didn't understand was everybody on the face of this planet wants something. From California to Boston to New York to Atlanta to Florida, you can go to somebody and say, hey, man, what do you want? Man, I want this. I want a house for my family. I want this much money in the bank. I want a question in my... Everybody wants something. It's like that quote that says, everybody wants to win, but everybody doesn't have the will to prepare to win. Everybody wants the victory, right? Everybody wants it. Right. But he didn't realize the question that changed. It was no longer about what do you want? Now it's about what are you willing to go through in order to get it? Everybody want it. But he didn't understand there was a certain level of opposition and adversity that was going to test that level of belief and that level of purpose and that thing that he said he was going to stay true to. The reason I love opposition and adversity, not that I get up every single day and I say, come see me. No. But when it comes, like I fly all the time, right? Like all the time, right? And so I hit different moments in airports and like I see people get mad. They almost make me mad. I got to walk off like I'm not even trying to get mad. They're making me mad. Right? Like people start going bunkers in the airport. <laughs> but I was flying to Texas A&M two weeks ago. And things are going well. Get my first flight to Dallas, because they're in College Station, so you got to connect. Get my first flight to Dallas, everything goes well. I'm talking to my wife. I'm like, man, flight's going smooth. Can't wait to speak tonight. And so I go to the gate, and I'm sitting there, and I see the pilot go on, and then he comes off. Right? And when he, he's coming off, I'm like, hey, man, how you doing? Where you going? He got his bags. I'm like, what, what's happening? <laughs> like, yeah, we hit a bird. I'm like, oh, my God, you got to be kidding me. A bird? He's like, yeah, they got to wash the plane. They got to do maintenance. I'm like, we just can't keep going. Like, the bird gone, right? <laughs> like, we can't just get in the plane and bounce? He's like, no, it's this whole protocol deal. He could dent the plane. I'm like, okay. He said, as long as you don't see the plane tow truck come up, we're good. And me and him go sit down five seconds later. He's like, oh, there's the plane tow truck. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Murphy's Law, right? Two hours later, we finally get a plane. We get on the plane. Everything's going great. People are nice, right? We go to pulling off the runway. They stop the plane. Pilot comes over the intercom and says, I'm sorry, guys. We got to go back to the gate. They forgot to move the luggage. I said, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> I said, they forgot to move the luggage. They had two hours. I said, nobody thought about it. I'm like, the problem wasn't even the adversity. That wasn't a problem for me. Like, adversity is a part of life at this point. The problem was when the adversity happened, they couldn't respond to it. Right? In other words, like, people live life and think they're going to rise to the occasion. You don't rise to the occasion. You revert back to your training. Meaning who a person is every single day in every situation, like it's a mentality, it's essence, it's core, right? In other words, one of my best friends was the highest paid safety in the NFL a couple of years ago. 
He goes to a game, he's playing, everything is going great. Great person, right? Goes to make a tackle, he feels a lump in his chest. Make a long story short, we talk, they diagnose him with cancer. Lymphoma. No signs of it. He starts going to chemo treatment at Emory University. Got all the money in the world. Great person. He's going to chemo treatments. We're in church one day. He comes out, he wipes his eyebrow, and his eyebrow is coming off. He starts scratching his hair, and his hair is coming out. He's standing in the bathroom behind the door, and he's trying to get somebody to go and get him a hat. And one day after chemo, he leaves chemo, and he goes and he jumps out on the track. And he's running 400s after chemo. And everybody from the time he left chemo until the time he was being transported to the track, everybody was saying to him, go home. You just left chemo. Like you needed to go and let your body rest, man. Like chemo, it drains you. Go home. He's like, no, this is what I do. This is my routine. And as he's running the 400s around the track, he's crying. And he's crying and he says, I'm crying not because I'm in so much pain. I'm crying because I'm not who I used to be, but I know I'm going to come back one day stronger than I used to be. In other words, the opposition was just a part of it, but who he was every single day of his life, like he just responded out of sheer habit. And his people every single day, they live life and they got that light switch mentality. And it's predicated upon, I might give you everything I got if I get what I'm supposed to get. I might show up and go hard. I got the skill set. I might go hard if all the chips line up. If it unfolds the way I thought it was going to unfold, I'm going to give you everything I got. But if I don't get what I'm supposed to get, I might show up. I might not. And so I tell people every single day, man, give me character over talent. Because I know character going to be there. And talent, talent might take a person to a place that their character can't keep them if it's not developed. And so what happened was, when I got to high school, a cop said something to me, and I loved it. And it made everybody else peed off. And what he said to me was, my first day at high school, we're, we got a metal detector. It was basically TSA before TSA, <laughs> right? It's cops behind the metal detector. And I get there, and I'm excited, and I'm at Crim High School in Atlanta. And Crim was called Crime High in Atlanta. Dropout rate higher than the graduation rate. People didn't go to college, right? And so when I get there, I'm standing and I got both arms out. And I'm excited. Freshman year. And the cop is searching me. And the way they make you posture your body, you put your arms out, head to the ceiling. They search you, crown of your head, bottom of your feet, back up to your midsection. And so I'm there and I'm getting searched. And he says to me, what's your plan, little man? I said, oh, man, I'm going to college. I'm going D1. He says, you'll probably go to cell block D1. And he goes to walk off. And so I start walking with him, and I'm thinking it's an honest mistake. And so I tap his arm. I say, man, excuse me, but I've never seen you a day in my life. So I'm sure this is a mistake, sir. He said, no, I know about you. I said, really? He said, yeah, you had uncles come here, right? Play ball kind of like you, right? I said, yes, sir. He said, aren't they serving 13 and 40 years at the federal penitentiary, right down the street? I said, yes, sir. He said, the apple don't fall too far from the tree. He said, you'll probably end up in cell block D1. He went to walk off. I walked with him. I said, he definitely got the right one now. <laughs> he definitely got the right one. I tapped his arm. He turned around. I said, I'm telling you. He said, we'll see. I said, we will. And my senior year, when I got my scholarship from Tennessee, I went in the lunchroom. He was on lunchroom duty. I slid the paper across the table to him. He stood up. He said, um, I want to ask you a question. I said, what you got? He said, how did you do it? He said, you thought when I said that to you I was trying to break you? I said, yeah, it came across pretty harsh. He said, but I heard so many people say it. He said, I heard so many people say what they wanted, what they were going to do. Like, I heard so many people say it to the point to where their, their actions started to betray their words. He said, I just wanted to see when you said it, would you be willing to fight for the very thing that you said you wanted? And so when I said that to you, I just wanted to see would you retreat and say, you know what, man, you're probably right. Or when I walked off, would you walk with me and tap me on my shoulder and say, I'm, telling, I'm willing to fight for what I want? Right? I just didn't want you to let your actions betray your words. And so when I got to Tennessee, Tennessee was Mayberry for me. 
I'm like, man, y'all get five pair of cleats, steak, shrimp, and spaghetti? <laughs> I'm like, this gravy train. <laughs> right, my first day there, they take me out, feed me good. Like, I wasn't used to being wined and dined. I wasn't used to that. And so the whole time, I'm telling them, y'all don't have to do this. I'm here. Like, I'm coming. They're like, no, we got to show you a good time. And the guy says to me, Inky, have you ever been to a sorority party? I'm like, no, I've never been. <laughs> he said, we're taking you tonight. I'm like, oh, okay. I said, you mind taking me back to the Marriott to my room? Oh, yeah, I'll take you up, get changed. And we pull up to the Marriott, and I'm getting out of the car, and I say to the guy, I said, all right, brother, I'll see you in the morning. He said, what? He said, man, I told you we got to go to the sorority party. I said, man, I'm cool. He said, man, are you sick? I said, no, man, I'm not sick. I said, man, this is my first time being in a room with a bed by myself, and it's a king size at that. <laughs> I said, bump that sorority boy. I got my own bed, brother. <laughs> got up in that room. I called my boys back in Kirkwood. I'm like, y'all got to go to college. <laughs> They're like, college? I'm like, get your own bed, right? All of us slept on the floor. And my next meeting, I meet with my advisor. They said, what's your plan? I said, my plan is to graduate three years and go to the NFL. They said, well, you didn't just knock it out in the classroom. I said, yeah, but I, I really need to help my family. And I come into my third year, and I'm watching film one day on the California Bears. Never forget it. My coach comes in, Larry Slade, great leader, great man. He says, Inc., I got some great news for you. I dropped the clicker. I said, what you got, coach? Hands me the first piece of paper. He said, man, can you believe you're on track to graduate in three years? I said, man, that's awesome. Hands me the second piece of paper. At the top, it had NFL, projected top 30 draft pick as a cornerback. In other words, first round draft pick, automatic multimillionaire. All you got to do is complete your next 10 football games. I ran out of the room. I called my mother and my grandmother on the three-way. They picked up. I said, listen, after this season, our lives will never be the same. I said, we'll never struggle again. We'll never miss another meal. Like, things are about to be different. And little did I know our lives would never be the same. We come out first game, play against California Bears, get the victory, I get nominated SEC Defensive Player of the Week, had a great game, everything's off to a great start. Second game, playing against the Air Force, game is basically over. Two minutes left in the game, and we go into the huddle. And so we break the huddle, and I say to my teammates, man, if the ball comes to our side of the field, let me hit him. I said, I'm going to hit him, separate him from the ball, I'm going to end it. And so the play starts to unfold, and I'm a cornerback. And so I had a quarter of the field. And so I'm just backpedaling, and I see the play unfolding, and the quarterback is releasing the ball to a guy on their team, a receiver. He catches it. He's coming right at me. And so I'm like, man, thank you, God. I got exactly what I asked for. And I got about a 20-yard head full of steam. Ran a 4-3-8, 40-yard dash. I'm coming, right? And as soon as I make contact with him, Something different happened that had never happened to me before in my life. As soon as I hit him, it seemed as if every breath in my body left. My body went completely limp. I fell to the ground. I blacked out. It had never happened to me before. When my eyes opened, my teammates ran over to me. They said, ink it up. Let's rock. Let's close them out. I said, I can't. They said, what do you mean you can't? You always get up, man. You're our guy. I said, I can't. They said, what do you mean you can't? You always get up, man. We need you. I said, I can't move. So what do you mean you can't move? I said, there's a shock going from the crown of my head to the bottom of my feet. I can't feel anything. The shock eventually leaves, and it stays in my right arm and hand. They bring the spine board out. They put me on the spine board. They're willing me off the field, and we get beside the ambulance. And my father's standing there, and I say to my father, Pops, I got him, right? I put it on him, right? He said, yeah, son, but I think you got the worst part of this one. They roll me up in the ambulance. Doctor said, we'll take you over on a couple tests. It's football. Things happen. You'll be fine. They take me over. They run their test. They bring me back into the room. My mother comes in. She kisses me. She says a prayer. She cracks a joke. She says, Ink, you'll be fine. It's football. And she's going to walk out, and I'm in the bed, and I'm watching my mother walk out of the room, but from the opposite side, I can hear someone running. And so when I turn to look, it's the head doctor. And at this point, he's screaming. And he's saying, guys, guys, get in here. We got to rush this kid back to emergency surgery. He's about to die. And I'm looking at him, and I'm like, man, you can't use another word? <laughs> like, use a synonym, brother, like die? 
I'm like, die, die. It's like, yeah, die. I said, what happened? He said, you've ruptured your subclavian artery in your chest. You're bleeding internally. So we got to rush you back, take the main vein out of your left leg, plug it into your chest in order to save your life. His exact words were, or I guarantee you, you won't be here in the morning. I said, let's go. The next morning I woke up from surgery. The game of football on my scale of life was that big. NFL, million dollar contract, I was embarrassed. People were coming into my room saying, um, Inky, we're sorry about what happened to you. And have you ever been through something to where the situation holds such a level of conviction it makes you self-assess and question yourself? I'm like, man, was that all you wanted? Like, was that it? You just wanted the NFL and the contract? Like, that's it? You just wanted some money? Like, that's it? Like, you were efficient, but you weren't effective. You did things right, but you weren't doing the right thing. Was that it? Like, all the gifts and talents and skill set that you have been blessed with, anything that revolved around the door of you making it to the NFL, you didn't give it much attention or much energy because it wasn't helping you or propelling you to where you were trying to go. I said, think about all the times you had to make a difference in somebody's life, but because it wasn't interconnected to the NFL, you didn't give it much attention. Like, it reminded me of a time I was on a plane and I was headed to Dallas. And I'm sitting there in my seat and I'm dozing in and out. And a lady comes to me and she taps my shoulder and says, Mr. Johnson, I am a physician. I really need to switch seats with you. I say, yes, ma'am, where's your seat? She pointed me to it. I'm going back and I'm taking my seat. And as I'm taking my seat, the pilot comes over the intercom and says, I'm sure you guys are aware of what's going on. I'm like, man, did she just trick me? Like, we're about to go down. That's cold blooded. Right? And then he followed it up with, there's a gentleman having a heart attack. Looked up, I could see it. Yeah, I was two seats away from where I was sitting. I could see him working. And when the pilot said, there's a gentleman having a heart attack, everybody on the plane was like, whoa. Then he followed it up and said, we have to make an emergency landing. Majority of the people was like, man, let's do it. Let's save my man, let's do it. It was a few like, huh? I got some, I got some, I got to go. And I said to myself, I get it. I said, people probably been away from their children. People probably got things to do. I had to be on stage. I got it, 100%. But I said to myself, man, is that what we've gotten to, to where destination has become more important in human life? Not Dallas, goals, dreams, and aspirations. Like you meet some people, you're like, man, you got it. Like you're smart, you're intelligent. I said, you're ambitious. I said, but be careful you don't get blinded by your own ambition. It's kind of like when you tell a person, be careful when you're reaching for the stars that everybody you love don't get burned up by the heat. What good is it to write a million dollars and you lost your family behind it? What good is it to become a public success, but behind closed doors you're a private failure because you don't have the level of dedication and commitment to apply it not only to a career, but to every aspect of our lives and everything that we do. That's the individual I want to be. I want to be the cat like you know the truth when they walk in the bathroom and they talk about you. Not when you're present, like you walk in the bathroom by accident, and they're like, man, that, that cat, John, he's pretty cool. And you're in the bathroom, so you know it's true. <laughs> Like when you're in a the room, they might be trying to jazz you a little bit, right? But having the character to apply it to everything that I do. Like that cut me six times down my left thigh, one time across the left side of my neck, one time across the right, twice through my right ribs, cut out my right pec, bottom of my armpit to the bottom of my hand, put 350 staples in my body, bandaged me from my neck to my knees. This ain't lip service. I had to learn how to walk again. I was right hand dominant. I had to learn how to write again. And so I view life differently. Like when you talk about furnishing dreams, like I, I view things differently, right? Like it's hard for me to understand how a person can just do something and don't take pride in it. It's hard for me to understand how a person can come into a space and say, man, why not? Let's try to be great at this thing. It's just like when I was playing football, we would show up 4.45 a.m. and they had a big red countdown clock, 60 second countdown clock. We would get out of bed 4.45 a.m. We're on a line getting ready to run 110 110s. And guys would stand on the line, complain, complain, complain. When the clock hit zero, they would take off, they would do the sprints. And afterwards, we'd walk up in a circle and I would just pose the question. 
Why come into an environment, complain about being in an environment, but still do the work? I said, if you don't want to be here, go. Like, if you want to bring good energy to it, go. I said, because I got news for you. They ain't sending a FedEx package to your door feeding your kids. They ain't sending a UPS package to your door and taking care of your wife. It ain't happening. So if you don't want to be here, go. Right? Like, we were playing football at that point. But I was trying to get them to understand football was a correlation to life. And everything we do, we never separate the mentality. We never separate the spirit. Like, my arm and my hand got paralyzed. My heart didn't. My arm and my hand got paralyzed. My drive didn't. My arm and my hand got paralyzed. My dedication, my commitment didn't. My work ethic didn't. Because I only knew one way. When they told me to go home, it was foreign to me. When they told me to stop, take a break, it was foreign to me. When they told me, Inky, go, man, just take some time off, it was foreign to me. I'm like, no, I got a team. Like, that's the thing I loved about sports. That's the thing I miss about it. Like, Saturdays were cool. I got to talk a little trash, break up a couple passes, inflict a little control level of violence. I like that, too. <laughs> but if you ask me what I miss about it, I miss this. I miss this. I miss being a part of something. And the purpose of what we were all working for was greater than any one of us. I miss that. I miss coming into an environment like, bro, how you doing, man? You good? No, Ink, I'm not having a good day. Lean on me today. I got you, brother. I miss coming into an environment. Ink, how you feeling today, man? Not, not a good day for me. I got you. Lean on me today. I miss that, man. Because business, like some of you all probably can do stuff. Like, you could do it with your eyes closed. You done did it so many times. Like, you can do it and not even think about it. Like, it's second nature to you. You can show up. You can knock it out regardless of how you're feeling. Right? But every single day, what are we really working for? Like, at the end of the day, what is it really about? Like, what are we trying to become every single day? Because I think we all know the raw truth of it in life is people don't burn out because of what they do. They burn out because life makes them forget why they do it. Like, nobody shows up and says, oh, man, we're going to crush it. Then one day they come in like, man, I'm not feeling it. No, life hits them with something. And as people, you can never give what you don't possess. And so my attitude to opposition is this. And I'm going to leave you with this. Because I'm Baptist. I'll be up here all day. Right? <laughs> I'm Baptist, right? I get it in up in here. Right? And so something happened this past Christmas with me, my wife, and my two children. And I didn't expect it, right? It, it rocked our world a little bit. And so me and my wife, we were out and Christmas shopping. Well, she was Christmas shopping. I was praying she didn't spend too much money. <laughs> and I'm walking, and we're in a store we're about probably 10 yards away from each other. And so I'm walking with my head down, and I walk up on many four-wheelers, right? And I see them, and I get semi-excited. And so I look at my wife thinking she's going to pose the same excitement. And so when I look at her, she's like, no. <laughs> I'm like, well, come on, man. Let us get one for our son. She's like, no, they're dangerous. I said, well, let us get two for our son and our daughter. Like, that's how I respond to adverse. I double down, right? <laughs> I double down, right? She's like, no, you already got a hurt arm. I'm like, oh, man, I got to walk around the store, get a purse, she'll give in. Walked around, got a purse, she gave in. I got two, right? <laughs> Christmas Day, we get up. And kids are going to open the presents. And I had got up a little earlier to crank them up, you know. And my son, he's running by the window, and he sees it. And he's like, Dad, bump that. Let's go out to the little bike things. <laughs> I'm like, let's go, Ink. Let's do it, man. And so we run out. I got the elbow pads. I got the knee pads. I got the helmet. I got the Vaseline. I know it's about to get rough. <laughs> I know at least one time we're going to get got, right? I know it's coming. So we're out. We're getting Vaselined up, putting the pads on, right? And so grandma comes out, and she's recording. So she's like, oh, it's going to be awesome. Cousins come out, oh, man, ink is going to be awesome. So my wife's the last one to come out. She's really not feeling it. She's like, oh, yeah, it's going to be cool, whatever, right? And so the way I teach my kids, I teach them in cold words, right? And so we had the four-wheeler there, and I'm talking to my son, and I said, okay, ink, I'm going to sit you on the seat, and I'm going to sit on the back rack. I said, now, the first two cold words are light and heavy. I said, when I say light, you barely mash it. We're going to ride, you know, a little photo op, presidential wave, let them get their pictures, video. We all good, right? 
I said, now when I say heavy, you pedal to the metal, you mash it. <laughs> I'm fist pumping, screaming, you scream, we're all out. He's like, got it. We're riding light, heavy, he's getting it, right? I said, now the next two words are skinny and wide. I'm teaching you how to turn. I said, now when you're on it by yourself, you can turn skinny, you'll be good, everything will be great. I said, but when I'm on there with you, you can't turn skinny because it's a strong possibility. You're going to throw me off of there, and my wife, your mom, not going to let us live it down in 2030, right? <laughs> I said, so when I'm on there, you turn wide. We'll be in the clear. You turn it wide, we're safe. And so we're riding, and he's doing very well. He's getting it. And so we come over the stretch, and we're going over these humps. And I say to him, I said, ain't go wide. And somehow he heard skinny, and he whips it. Right? And he's seven, so you know his whip is extra whip. <laughs> right? And when he whips it, sure enough, I come off the back and I'm in midair. And I look back under my armpit because I'm looking for my wife. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and as soon as, as soon as I lock eyes with her, she's already in stride, running. <laughs> Jaw shaking, right? And so I hit the ground and I roll. And when I roll and I look up, my son had hit the ground. Right? Four wheeler flipped over. And so we're on 15 acres, so my wife's still coming, right? And so I'm like, ink, think quick. I'm like, you got to beat your wife to your son because she beat you to him. She's going to make him think he got shot 20 times. Right? <laughs> and so my son, I can see he in a panic. My man looking like, what happened? <laughs> and so I get up and I grab him, right? And I stand him up and I grab the four-wheeler. I stand it up and I dust my son off and his head is bleeding, right? And my elbow is bleeding, right? And so I sit him on the four-wheeler. Right? And I sit on the back rack, and I said to him, I said, Ink, go! <laughs> and he, he says to me, Daddy, you want me to leave mommy? <laughs> I said, son, you don't know what mommy's going to do when she get here. Right? I said, now go heavy! <laughs> and he mashes it. Right? And midway down the driveway, he screams out, Dad, this is the best thing ever! I said, I know, buddy. I said, now turn wide. Let's go back up where grandma and mommy is. We're going to park it. Turns wide, clean, go back up. Grandma and mommy, they're hot as fish grease. <laughs> right? And so the whole time, they're grilling me. Why did you do that? Look at you. You're always on this. You want to get up. Like, they're, they're giving it to me, right? I'm usually motivated, but I got to take it this time. Right? <laughs> You're bleeding. He's bleeding. Why did you do that? And I said, the reason I did it was because if we didn't attack the opposition, the adversity, and the challenge in that moment, it would have paralyzed him for the rest of his life. Not physically. His perspective, right? There's a quote that says, your perspective can become your passport or your prison. I said, it wasn't about the four-wheeler. It wasn't about my wife. It was about teaching my son, when life knocks your butt down, I need you to get back up, and I need you to go heavy on it. The lesson was when uncertainty creeps in, I need you to get back up and I need you to go heavy on it. The lesson was when you taste a little bit of blood, son, I need you to get up and I need you to go heavy on it. When things don't go the way you want it to go, I need you to get up and I need you to go heavy on it. In the midst of opposition, in the midst of challenges, in the midst of adversity, everybody has a purpose when everything is going well. But somehow some people's purpose seem to forget when they face opposition, adversity or challenge and the things that they once said they wanted, they no longer want it when things don't go the way they want it to go. And so the only thing I want from you is I know you could do what you do well. I know you could do it like it's nobody's business. I'm not a guy that's going to try to tell you how to do what you do. I got too much respect for you in order to do that. But the thing I do want from you is this. Never allow life to make you forget why you do what you do and why you live your life every single day. Opposition doesn't deserve that. Adversity doesn't deserve that. A challenge, it doesn't deserve that. Let's not only stay committed in our careers, let's stay committed to everything that we touch. Everything that we're a part of, let's make it better because of our presence. And the type of commitment that I'm speaking of is the commitment that says, I am going to stay true to what I said I would do long after the mood that I've set it in has left. Meaning the first feeling we got when we first started doing it. Let's go back to that moment. That's my time. God bless you guys. Thank you.